Thank you. Uh, it's hard to follow all those great speakers. <laughs> really interesting, but I'm going to tie my talk in, fortunately, to a lot of what they were saying today. Uh, I'm going to look about um, how we try to encourage eating habits that are sustainable and healthy in low affluent groups. What does it mean in practice? So really moving into the practical, practical side of it. Um, I'm just going to very quickly talk about my background because I always like to know what, what's the person who's presenting, what, where they come from. Uh, I've been working about 30 years as a dietitian, and that should say trying to influence behaviour change rather than influencing behaviour change, I think. And I now work, um, again, still trying to influence behaviour change, but I'm still a bit of one-to-one, -one, but I do a lot more other interventions now, things like shopping tours in supermarkets, cooking courses, those sorts of approaches as a dietitian. And my main focus is now is with low affluent groups. And the two examples that I put up there is I work in a food bank in Bristol. Anybody from Bristol here? Hi! <laughs> I work for something called the Matthew Tree Project, which is um, a chain of uh, food banks. Food bank plus, really. So we give budgeting advice. We give all sorts of other advice as well. Uh, and we had about a thousand clients using our service last year and one of the differences with us is that our clients stay with us quite a long time so they stay with us about 13 weeks on average so we get to build up quite a good relationship and we get to understand the clients needs and talk to them and get a lot of useful information back from them about how best we can help them and of course they come on our shopping tours and our and our cooking courses. I also work in a men's prison, which is an interesting job. Have we got anybody else here who works in prison? Prisons? No. <laughs> Caught you, glad to catch you out there. Yeah, that's an interesting job. Obviously, not everybody who's in prison is, is low affluent, but um, there's quite a lot of people that come on my cooking and nutrition talks that are, are uh, struggling with finances on that side of it. But first, that's just a bit about my background, just to put it in context. But before we go on to the main body, I'm going to do a quick quiz because I'm just like, it's so ingrained in me, this is teaching. I'm going to put up some statements and it'll be easy for some of you, some of these, but I just want you to vote whether you think these are true or false. This is just to get you thinking about the broad area that we're going to cover. So, answers will be in it as we go along. I won't say the answers now, but I'll ask you to vote. So, most plant proteins lack at least one essential amino acid and not as good as and not as complete as animal proteins. Who thinks that's true? Who thinks that's false? Oh, okay. That was that really split the group. As I said, I won't tell you these now. We'll cover them as we go through. Tinned and frozen fruit and vegetables have fewer nutrients than fresh. Who thinks that's true? Oh, nobody. Okay, who thinks that's false? Okay, I thought that would be an easy one for you. In stores, the cheapest foods on the shelf are at eye level. <coughs> Is that true? No. no? Where are they? At the bottom, okay. I'll show you a bit more about that. Switching energy provider saves more money than reducing food waste. Who thinks that's true? Nobody. Oh, okay, who thinks... Do the rest of you think that's false? Yeah, okay, okay. 70% of total food waste occurs in the home. Now, can that possibly be true? Who thinks that's true? Who thinks it's false? Okay, okay. 70% of food waste is avoidable, i.e. it could have actually been eaten. So I'm not talking about things like the peel on potatoes or... Um, the tops of carrots. I'm talking about stuff that could actually have been eaten. Who thinks that's true? Oh, we've got a big response for that one. Anyone think it's false? All right. The cost to an average family in edible waste is £455 a year. Who thinks that's true? Anybody think that's false? Oh, again, that's split the audience. All right. And the final one. The most common reason for food waste is cooking and preparing too much. Who thinks that's true? 
few people who thinks it's false. So what do you think? The people that said false, what do you think the biggest reason is? All right, okay, okay. Well, that gives you a flavour for some of the areas that I'm going to talk about in this, in this short session. Thank you for participating. So just before we, we get into the nitty-gritty, I thought it would be useful to raise three key points around this whole thing, the three key points that I keep in my mind when I'm working with, with low affluent groups. Number one is that food is a major expenditure. It's the third biggest expenditure after housing, which includes our power, our gas and electricity, and transport. Now, does that resonate with everybody in this room? Do you think it's your third biggest expenditure? Uh, lots of nods. Okay. Well, as a, as a population as a whole, um, it, it's the third biggest. The second key thing here is that food prices have actually risen. If you take the last 10 years, food prices have risen above wages. Uh, and actually, that has a bigger impact on low affluent households. And the reason for that is because people, stay in, people in low affluent households spend a higher percentage of their income on food. So it's had quite a detrimental effect, the fact that food prices have risen above, above wages. And the third key thing here, and some of our other speakers touched on this, was that actually sometimes in deprived areas, and certainly where I come from in Bristol, you can, you can really see this very clearly, is that certain deprived areas actually have very poor healthy food availability. And where it is there, it's actually at a higher cost. And the term for that I'm sure you're familiar with is food deserts. Uh, so three key things to bear in mind when we're looking at, at uh, trying to promote healthy and sustainable eating in low-income groups. And I mentioned just then that uh, it disproportionately affects people on low income because they spend a greater percentage of, of income. So if you look at this slide, over on that side, we've got all UK households. So the average is somewhere between 10 and 11%. So this goes over the last um, 12 years along the bottom here, uh, and it differs slightly, but it's somewhere between 10 and 11% of, um, of our spend is on food, eaten at home. If you take that as food, including food eaten out, food takeaways, that's about 16%. And interestingly, the average is two thirds spent at home, one third spent on eating out and takeaway. And it doesn't differentiate between uh, eating out and takeaway. So it could be high end restaurants, it could be um, takeaways in that figure. But when you tease out the lower income group, the 20% by equivalized income, it's actually much higher. It's about 14% is spent on food at home. And at some points over the last 10 years, that the figures have actually been higher, around 16, 17%. So it's quite a big difference. And about 21% spent on all food. And I find this quite interestingly. It's a different split. It's about three quarters of the money is spent at home and about a quarter on eat out and take away. So it's a big cost and it's a proportionately damaging cost to people on low income. So does that have any impact? What does the data show around what, what impact? And certainly um, both Paul and Duncan uh, touched on this, is that there are differences in, um, in health and um, health related conditions between the most deprived and the least deprived in the UK. So are there differences in diet? Well, in terms of fat, salt and sugar, not so much. Those are high. Those are, those are different across... Uh, sorry, they're higher than recommended across all income groups. Slightly worse on some of the surveys in low-income groups, but they're universally pretty bad across the UK population. But what's really um, poignant is it's actually things like fibre, vitamins, minerals, so things like iron, calcium, some of the vitamins. Fruit and veg, oily fish are significantly less in low affluent groups in, in the UK. And as I said, diet and lifestyle related health inequalities are quite, are quite dramatic if you look at um, the figures for different levels of, of income around the UK. And I've given you all the references for this at the bottom of the slides. So we know that it has a big impact, the cost of food, and we know that it changes diet. 
what I thought might be quite useful just to do is a quick, just to get us thinking about what factors might be barriers to eating a healthy and sustainable diet. So I've made up a lady from my food bank uh, and I've kept it really simple in terms of the details about her. But she's a single parent with two children. She's on low income and she's working part time. She recently moved home, maybe a divorce, and she's moved to a new home on a housing estate and she's got no car. I wondered, I've got eight key barriers here. I wondered if we could just generate these as an audience, see if we can come up with what are the barriers that might be preventing her from eating a more healthy and sustainable diet. Shout out anything you like. It might be ones that I haven't even got, so that's fine as well. Anybody want to start? Access. So do you mean actually not being able to get to the... Yeah, and why might she have trouble with access? Absolutely. Access is really important, but it's one that we sometimes forget, yeah. Uh, and availability, even if she does get to the shop, have they got it, yeah? Anything else? Being really busy. Yeah, time. <laughs> She's got a lot on, hasn't she? So time, does it take more time to eat healthily and sustainably? So we've got two barriers. We've got access, availability, and we've got time, yeah? Skill and knowledge. Yeah. Confidence as well in terms of... Brilliant, yeah. All those three things are really important. So it might be knowledge, but it might actually be translating that knowledge into practical skills, and it might be confidence. Thank you. Those are three key ones. Anything Price. else? Pardon? Price. Price, money, cost, yeah. Yeah. So she's going to be thinking, does it cost more to, to eat healthily and sustainability? OK, anything else? I've got, there's a couple more that we haven't got. Carrying the food, like the actual weight, like buying fruit and vegetables. Yeah, yeah, if you think about it, she hasn't got a car, so that five a day for three people in their household, it's quite a major thing, isn't it? Yeah. I haven't got that one down, but we'll add that in under availability and access. I think that's a good point. Yeah, anything else? Oh, yeah, it's really important. What are her children going to think about it? Family preferences. Those of you that got children are nodding, really. <laughs> I can see that. So she doesn't want to start using unusual healthy and sustainable foods. She doesn't know what the children are going to think of it, does she? And actually, fears around palatability, rejection and food waste are really major. OK, there's just two more that you haven't mentioned yet. Thank you, good. This is a great audience. <laughs> yeah, but not so kitchen facilities in terms of storage. I work with a lot of people that haven't even got a fridge, let alone a freezer. Uh, and lots of the tips you'll see sometimes about eating healthily on a budget say, so, you know, involve using freezer, don't they? Yeah. And also equipment, cooking equipment. And I'll show you some data in a minute from some of the groups I run about just what an issue equipment is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to put. I'm going to file that under family preferences because it sort of comes in there. But that's really specific. Yeah. So there's only one more that we didn't get yet, which actually is concerns over nutritional adequacy. And I find that all the time when I'm trying to promote more sustainable diets, people saying to me, "But well, what about the protein? What about you know? What about the calcium? What about the iron?" So let's have a look at those barriers. I think you got them all apart from that one. That's really good. Uh, so, yeah, there's lots of competing barriers. And with the money one, it might be, I mean, have you heard that expression, heat or eat? I get that a lot in where I work in the food bank in the winter. People saying to me, I've got to make a choice between whether I heat my house or whether I eat. Which one would you choose? Eat. Would you all choose eat? <laughs> I had a lady the other day who said who just didn't didn't eat anything but she couldn't bear being cold she hardly had any of her budget was spent on was spent on the food but yeah I'd choose food as well but yeah sometimes that is a real actual choice that people have to make so well I'd say all the speakers have all touched on this about how we actually overcome barriers uh, and I'm going to just feed back some of my experience from a practical point of view as a dietitian working in some of these settings. 
And I've divided it into three ways. So with the groups I run in prison and in the food bank, I find it really useful to split it into three things. Shop smart, cook clever and waste less. And actually they're all completely different and they're all potentially useful for people. So let's have a look at Shop Smart first. You like my picture of the supermarket? <laughs> Think how fast you have to go to get that. <laughs> so I'm going to focus on... Um, <laughs> I'm going to focus first on um, meat because that's a real key one we're looking and that's come up quite a lot today when we've been talking about, about plant-based proteins. So what are your options if, if you want to eat meat? You can choose cheaper products, you can reduce the amount, you can have more meat-free meals, I suppose those two sort of go together, or you can replace some or all with plant proteins, and we talked about that. And actually the research has shown quite clearly that it's actually much more acceptable to consumers to extend meat rather than cut meat out completely to actually maybe have some meat-free meals during the week, but also to extend the meat by using plant proteins in with the meat. And the BDA One Blue Dot and the Sacken and World Cancer recommendations are all unanimously uh, recommending the same thing, that we should be aiming for about less than 70 grams of meat a day, uh, 350 to 500 grams per week. That's cooked weight, by the way and also recommending that we avoid processed meats, so things like the bacon, ham, salami, frankfurters. And I don't know if this surprises you, but those account for about 12% of the food budget in the UK. Mm. It's quite high, isn't it? About £380 a year. So we can look at all of those strategies if we're advising people on low income how to manage shopping for meat. And I put up here, I used mysupermarket.com uh, just from, I think it was two weeks ago, the prices. And I've put up the price per 100 grams for steak, minced beef, chicken breast and pork. Does that surprise you at all, any of those? No? Nope. So they're all, um, the, the steak obviously is the most expensive, but the other meat proteins reasonably similar. What are the economical versions? Well... Things like liver, chicken thighs or drumsticks, this was frozen. Look how much cheaper that is to have. Turkey mince, substantially cheaper. Eggs, so the um, frittata is a great example there of how you can save money. And then the canned fish, brilliant value for money. This always really surprises people. They tend to think of it as being just salmon, and canned salmon is obviously quite pricey. But then the one too I want to really focus your attention on are there where we've done the extending the one that we know that people really like so that's maybe a bolognese or a chili where you've done half and half mince and kidney beans so per 100 grams that works out of 49p and then look at that amazing one where you've done chicken and chickpeas works out at 20p so it makes a really big difference and you aren't necessarily removing all the animal foods from that from that diet can you still hear me okay? Yeah, okay. So economical versions is one way and extending. The other way is to look at having more meat-free meals and going completely for, for plant proteins. So I've put the cost back there again of the minced beef, the chicken breast and the lean pork, which are actually three of the most popular products that are, are bought. Uh, and you can see how that compares with things like tofu, microprotein, soya mints, works out incredibly good value. And then if you go down to things like lentils, again, about 15p per 100 grams. So it actually is a really dramatic move to include more plant proteins. The thing I always get asked there at this point, though, is um, by other non-nutrition audiences, is are plant proteins as nutritious? Well, it's a really interesting answer. The protein content per 100 grams may be slightly lower for some plant proteins, but that's because they've got a better macronutrient profile. So better type of fat, actually contain fiber, carbohydrate, calcium, zinc, iron, all of those things, a much better overall profile for the plant proteins. And it was false that plant proteins are incomplete. 
Well, plant proteins do contain all the essential amino acids. Sometimes in some plant proteins, one of the amino acids is a lower level than the others. But we can compensate for that by having mixed plants in a mixed diet. Our bodies can actually store a pool of amino acids and mix those together. So it's not like every item or every, even every meal needs to have a perfect balance of plant proteins. And that's something that I don't think is very well recognised. I get asked that so often by people saying, but I'm going to go short of protein. I'm not going to get any essential amino acids. So us being in a position to be able to reassure people on that is really important. So we can meet our needs. It doesn't even have to be in the same meal. So when I trained as a student, there was all this thing about having baked beans on toast so that you got the cereals and the pulses. But now we know it doesn't even have to be in the same meal. So that's my tips for shopping smart for, for protein foods. The one that I find very tricky is fruit and vegetables because these are perceived by consumers to be expensive, aren't they? I get this all the time, people saying to me, oh, I, don't, I don't buy any fruit and veg, they're really, really expensive. And there's so many tips that we can give people for this. So special offers, and that was touched on by Nilali, economy ranges, own brand ranges, equally nutritious, and yet save a huge amount of money. Loose packs, so people are just buying the amount they need rather than necessarily, I was trying to make um, a, a leek dish the other day and I didn't want a giant packet of leeks, I just wanted one or two. Uh, so buying loose pack, people forget about that. Not pre-prepared. Can you think of what I'm referring to there? <laughs> Does anybody want to shout out? Well, yeah, diced onions, although I've got, to be, I've got to admit I have used diced onions. <laughs> I'm thinking of the little packs of salad where it's uh, all taken out. That is such an expensive way to buy your veg. Um, using more frozen, dried and canned, and I was really interested to hear the recipes at the back about making use of those sorts of vegetables. And then grow your own. Even if people haven't got a garden, actually, they're sometimes quite keen to grow herbs in pots. And I've had huge success with that, with our, our food bank clients actually um, providing some of the, the, the herbs and people growing it. Because herbs are really expensive to buy, aren't they? And it doesn't look like you get very much value for money. pound thirty-nine for a little pack of coriander. Somebody on low income does not really... Um, want to be doing that and even the jars are, are quite pricey so growing your own herbs I've had great success with people with that so there are ways around it um, and the types as well and um, we touched on that at the back when people were talking about fruit and vegetables that they were using in the dishes there but buying in season makes such a difference ones that are grown in the UK in terms of um, value for money and uh, environmental benefits, much better than the hot-housed, air-freighted ones. They're cheaper and they've got a lower environmental impact. And they're just as nutritious. I get asked about this all the time, about do I have to have blueberries and kale? Um, you know, no. The research has shown, and there's been so much really good research, shown that some of the most effective fruit and vegetables are actually things like the apples, pears, cabbage, cauliflower, root vegetables. Homegrown, in season, um, cheaper ones, not the fancy ones that are air freighted. And there was a fantastic study a couple of years ago from UCL, uh, I can't remember who it was, um, Paul may know, it's one of his colleagues, but looking at um, which, which were the most effective. And it was actually things like apples and pears and cabbage. So we don't need to be doing those funny superfoods. <coughs> oh, in fact, there, we are, I've got the name on it at the bottom of that reference, that was the guy. So, if you think about, can you get your five a day, how much do you think the minimum you would spend to get your five a day? What, can anybody have a guess? I try, I worked out with loads of different things, thinking about what people actually like, and how, how can you get, how much do you think that five a day cost me? 90p, any advances either way? 70p? Ooh. Do you mean with proportions? Yeah, they're per portions. Okay. So that's five portions. Yeah? Okay. And can anybody have a guess, hazard a guess individually, any of those, how much they cost? Banana's like 20p, is that right? 
Okay, I'm going to show you in a minute. What was the most expensive one on there? Ah, oh, good, let me show you. Okay, so the banana was 14p. That was the supermarket banana from mysupermarket.com, bought individually. The apple was the most expensive at 25p. But the tin tomatoes, the cabbage and the frozen peas, look at that, that's per portion, per 80 gram portion. So actually you were right, whoever said 70, you were close enough. I managed to get that for 60p. <laughs> well done. <laughs> you get an extra slice of tortilla. <laughs> um, yeah, so you can do it, can't you? If that was blueberries and papaya and strawberries out of season, it would be a different matter, wouldn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, that's the supermarket price rather than a retail price as well, though. Yeah, no, it is. I mean, that would be a really good thing if we could get some of those sub subsidised, yeah. OK, the other thing with, with shopping is about... It was false that the um, economy level things are on eye level. And you are absolutely right, they're all down low. And my favourite thing is the bag of um, own brand oats that is always on the bottom shelf. You've got to bend right down to get that. But, you know, I say that to the people I work with. Don't always look at what's on your eye level. Look, look down. Sometimes you can look up and there's some bargains as well. But um, economy brands are often lower. <laughs> uh, Multi-buys, if you're going to use it in time. Now, a lot of people I work with at the real extreme end um, wouldn't even buy two to get a third free because that would just real mess up their budget. Buying in bulk isn't always uh, feasible for a lot of people. But um, sometimes those are really good, especially on non-perishables like pasta, cereals, tins, where you can keep it until you need it. So keep looking out for special offers can make it really good. And I love online supermarkets. Um, things like mysupermarket.com because you can actually have a look and see what's on offer in your local store really well. And a high percentage of items that are in prime locations are high fat, high sugar. They don't tend to be the nutrient dense foods and drinks. So again, uh, I'll, I'll warn some of my clients that, that um, they need to look uh, beyond the, out, the outsides of the, of the items of the shelves to find their, their good value for foods. Um, and the thing with the high fat, high sugar foods is not only do they have a health impact, but actually they've got, although they've got a low gre greenhouse gas impact, they're actually very land and water hungry. So you could argue that it's actually not a very good use of resources um, to, be, to be having a diet high in high fat, high sugar foods as well. So by that I'm thinking of things like the biscuits, cakes, confectionery, crisps. Um, cook Clever, this is my favourite one of my interventions because we run these cookery classes. Just some quick background, the time that's spent preparing meals is actually halved between 1980 and 2015. Uh, so in my working life, it's halved. And you were absolutely right when you came up with the barriers. <coughs> time, resources, things like equipment and facilities, and skills and confidence. These really are important, it's not just money. And about nearly 25% of meal occasions in the UK are pre-prepared, ready to eat or ready to cook, where you just put it straight into the cooker. Now, if you're on your own, that might not be the worst thing in the world, actually. You know, financially, sometimes that can work out quite well. But if you're feeding more than two people, then that works out really expensive to try and to buy all the separate individual pre-prepared meals. Um, what helps is, well, we've talked about this loads in this group, and we've seen it from the demonstration at the back. Meal makeovers without eliminating favourite dishes. So things like a uh, bolognese where there's lentils in with the mince, or uh, chicken casserole where there's pulses in there, or curry, or whatever. The, peop the people don't want to have completely unfamiliar dishes. So quick, easy, affordable, healthier, more plant-based recipes. And I was delighted to hear that we're going to be sharing the recipes we saw at the back. And the other thing is minimal fuel. 
When I first started running a cookery course, I, I it had quite a few recipes that actually went into the main part of the oven. And people told me, no, we don't want to turn our oven on. We want everything to be on top of the, of the hob. And the other thing is ingredients. So herbs and spices, 80% of people on the low income, this is, this is for my audits of, of our clients, lack any herbs and spices. So you've got to keep it really quite simple. Uh, and they were a huge expensive outlay for people to have. What we persuaded one of the companies in Bristol to do, who make herbs and spices, was donate a starter pack of herbs and spices to everybody who came on our cookery course. And that was so successful. You know, we couldn't have given a better thing in a way. You know, it was a really nice little pack of mixed spices that people had never, would never have gone out and bought. And in the Cook Clever, I've just put up a few quotes that I've collected, because I think each of these shows a different point. Before going on the course, I was spending £10 a day on takeaways. That was somebody from prison I might add. So um, now I'm more motivated to cook. It's confidence building. The recipes are so easy. If we can do that. I've changed my mind about certain foods. Now, that was couscous and um, soya, adami beans, I think. Uh, they can taste delicious. I've learned to use foods that I've never used before. And then it opened my eyes, my son enjoyed the food I made and I enjoyed the different tastes. So that taps into that area where we need to be thinking about family preferences and actually giving somebody a dish they can take home and try with their children before they outlay all the cost of it. It's really important. <coughs> and equipment, we really shouldn't. I was so pleased somebody said equipment and facilities because it is a real problem not having freezer or utensils. And this data is from an audit of my work with um, <coughs> our Matthew Tree project. One in 10 had no cutlery, no plates and no tin opener. So when we were giving food from the food bank, we actually had to go out and buy some tin openers as well. Otherwise, our people couldn't have used them. So one in 10 don't have those basics. One in four, no oven proof dish, no baking tray, no chopping board or no peeler. So it's actually a real problem. And sometimes these are split households where one household got all the cooking equipment or it could just be that they never had it in the first place. Uh, so what it does do is it leads to lower fruit and vegetables, more reliance on convenience and takeaways, which is exactly uh, what Duncan was saying about the real benefits of, of using that takeaway. If you haven't got any equipment, um, the more appliances somebody owns, the more frequently they do home prepared dinners. And there's been really interesting research on that. And so we found that whenever we ran a cooking course, we looked at providing cooking equipment for the people that didn't have it. Otherwise, there was absolutely no point. And I've just shown you here, this is the cheapest I can find of those. So it's still a reasonable outlay. Six pounds for a saucepan, four pounds for a frying pan, 10 pounds for a blender, that was the cheapest I could find, and 22 pounds for one of those real economy packs. So actually that startup is quite high in terms of cost. The final one is waste less. And this is so important in terms of money saving and, and environment. So just some background. It was true that 70% of food waste is in the home. And wasted edible food is about 17% of our total expenditure on food. So this isn't by weight, this is by money. 17% of what we spend on food ends up in the bin. 70% of food waste is avoidable, that was true. And there's definitely a role for advice on food purchasing, storage and preparation. So in all our courses now, we've put in a whole section on food waste, purely on food waste. So I had to get up to speed really quickly with with what are the best tactics. And if you do it in finances, it was false that it was 455 pounds a year for a family. It's actually 770 for a family. Think what you could do with that money. And for an individual, it's 220. These are the most recent figures last year from, from RAP. And switching off your home lights for a year only saves you 15 pounds. Changing energy supplier on average saves you 200 pounds. So actually, you're far better off looking at food waste. I mean, you can do both, but if you ask people perception, I think they'd probably say it's energy in the home. It's, it's actually food waste. 34% of fruit, vegetables, salad becomes wasted food. Oh, my goodness. 
Isn't that a terrible statistic? Potatoes, bread, milk and soft drinks are also wasted. But interestingly, it's less than 5% of confectionery is wasted. When was the last time anybody threw away a bit of chocolate in this room? <laughs> no, I thought not. Um, yeah, so it's, it disproportionately affects the foods that we want to be encouraging people to eat. And this is a brilliant little graph that Elfie did for me, which I thank you, which shows you the proportions of wasted food and drink by cost. So 27% of the cost is on fruit and vegetables, only 20% is on meat and fish. Prepared meals, 13% of the cost. So again, that's quite interesting, isn't it? The different things that we're... That we're um, and it's less than 2% of biscuits, chocolates and sweets. Oh, it's 2%. So the tips that I give people, as I say, we put this in now as a really important part of it. Planning, portioning, using leftovers, storing food and understanding their labels. Now these don't come from me, these come from Love Food, Hate Waste, but they are fantastic and I've adapted them to use with my, my clients. So planning, buying only what's needed. It seems like a real drag, doesn't it, to buy a list, to write a list. Um, but list writers save up to £145 a year. Planning um, six main meals and making up the rest from leftovers. Keeping receipts so you know what's wasted. Using tinned and frozen. And photographing your cupboards or your fridge before you go out on your phone can be really useful. Mm -hmm. Have I got time to do these last couple of slides? Yeah. Uh, portioning. So it was false that, portion, that too much cooked or uh, prepared was, was the most. You were absolutely right. It was um, buying too much, not used in time, was number one. But still, 26% of the cost of edible food wasted is cooking or buying too much. And I think this is really useful. Can you see that pound coin diameter for, for pasta? But on the link below, um, the Find Your Balance link from the BNF, there's really good guidance about portion sizes. So it's about two handfuls. And most of us cook way more pasta or rice than we need and end up throwing it away. Only 37% use leftovers. A family can save about £260 a year. So again, it's more than swapping energy provider. But some key things that I always need to go through with my clients is that you want to eat the leftovers within two days and for cooked rice within a day. And then storing food. So buying some fruit that's ripe and some that's going to ripen later. I mean, as, as when you go for your shop, it's a great tip. Check in your fridge, your freezer, and then not putting things like bread or potatoes, banana in the fridge because they go off quicker in there. Whereas most other fruit and veg last longer in there. And then finally, understanding date labels. 43% of the cost of edible waste was food not used in time. And a really high percentage of consumers misunderstand date labelling. Best before is about quality rather than safety. So you might be able to eat it after the best before date, but it might no longer be at its best. Use by is the one we need to be concerned about, and that's safety. And even if it looks and smells okay after that time, it's not safe to eat. There's a real difference, and I found so many of my clients have said they saved money by knowing the difference between those two. So my final slide, um, just some final thoughts. Healthy, sustainable eating is not necessarily more expensive. You can actually save money by having more plant foods um, versus current healthy eating. It just needs a bit of help with the practicalities. The barriers are not always lack of knowledge, and we've seen that from all the presentations today. Things like access, confidence and skills really matter as well. And information at the personal level, so something like the Shop Smart Cook Clever Waste Less that I use can really help people to do that. Um, and the key consumer message is to shift towards plant-based eating rather than suddenly give up all animal foods. And it's a win-win for the health of people, nutrition, environment and budget. And it doesn't mean no meat. So I think it's a really simple, positive message on how we can eat more plant foods. It's really appealing and it's achievable, even for low affluent groups. And I've certainly found that the people I'm working with are really, really positive about that idea.